All right, welcome to Lightroom Classic 2020. So today we're gonna to start a new series in which I go from the beginning basically to the end to show you how to import and then to final export within Lightroom Classic. The first thing that you need to know, there are two completely different versions of Lightroom on the Adobe Creative Cloud. The first one, this one, is called Lightroom Classic. This is not an old version of Lightroom. This is just the one that works on desktops and laptops, so it's optimized to work on those platforms. The other one is Lightroom CC. Lightroom CC is for a mobile platform, meaning like an iPad or an iPhone or any sort of pad or an Android phone. We have two different versions. They do differ a little bit. What we're gonna be looking at is the desktop or laptop version of Adobe Lightroom. Now, once you open Lightroom on your computer, it should look something like this, except for it probably won't have any images because you haven't opened up any images yet. And that's gonna be okay, but what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go actually up into Lightroom Classic, and there are some preferences that you're most likely gonna to need to change or wanna change before you start using the program. Now I know this is not an exciting thing to do, but we're gonna do it anyways. A lot of what we see on here is gonna be the default. You can easily read a lot of this stuff. If you don't understand it, then just leave it where it is. We're gonna come up here to Presets, now, I'll tell you about this. This is something new on Lightroom. This preset allows you to set the default for when you import your images to the camera. By default, it's using the Adobe default presets, which are what I use. However, if you look on the back of cameras, you'll have a menu, and what they'll give you are some shooting or camera profiles. Some are built in, you can download them, and you can actually set up your own. If you wanna use one of those, all you have to do is click this, click the camera that you have, and then it's gonna allow that camera profile to come in and you can use it. I'm not gonna be using it, so I'm just gonna go ahead and turn that off, but that is available now. So we're gonna go into external editing. Now when you first open this up, it's gonna look more like this external editor down here. I've already set mine to go to Photoshop. You can set it to be whatever you want. Lightroom is a raw editing conversion program. Now this doesn't mean that you can't put JPEGs in it. You absolutely can stick any type of image file in it and it will be able to edit it. But it's really designed as a raw converter program. And Photoshop is an actual photo editing program. And, and there is a little bit of difference there. What happens is a lot of times people will do minor adjustments inside of Lightroom and then they'll send the photo over to Photoshop or Affinity or some other program that they're using. And that's what you would put in here. I personally like to use PSDs, but you could easily pick TIFF if you wanted. Next thing that we have is the color space. If you've never heard of color space, this is actually something you wanna familiarize yourself before you start getting into photography. There are two main color spaces. One is Adobe and the other one down here is sRGB. sRGB is the standard for the web. So anything on the web needs to be in the color space of sRGB. However, most photographers are either using Adobe or Pro Photo. The reason is you have a larger color gamut, meaning that you have more colors to work with in the image than you do in sRGB. So most photographers tend to use Adobe RGB because right now that's kind of the sweet spot. Pro Photo actually has a larger color gamut. The problem is most monitors can't support it, printers can't support it, the internet can't support it. So there's not a lot of stuff out there that actually supports that wide of a color gamut. So it doesn't really seem useful to me at this point. Next thing that we have here that's really, really important is if possible, you always want to edit in 16 bits. An 8-bit image has about 256 shades of gray. The color bit depth on 16-bit image is about 64,500. A whole lot more data and information in 16-bit. A little word to the wise, cameras actually don't shoot in 16-bit. They're usually around 12-bit. So you're not gonna quite get the full 64,000, but in Photoshop and Lightroom, 
you only have the choices between 8-bit and 16-bit. To edit your photo, you're going to have a much better quality image if you're editing in 16-bit, and then you can always convert back down to 8-bit. When you save anything as a JPEG, it doesn't support 16-bit. It's automatically going to save it out as an 8-bit, so it's no big deal there. Resolution, we're going to put at 300. That's basically what most stuff prints at, so we'll just set that as the default. You could also have a secondary editor, so if you had two different programs and you use one some of the time, you could easily load this in here and use that right there. You'll see this when we get to the import screen, but Adobe created something called the digital negative, and that's what DNG stands for, and they created this years ago, and what they were trying to do is create a universal raw format that they hoped everybody would convert to. Nobody converted to it, so Canon is CR2, Nikon is NEF, Sony is A something, I forget what their initials are, but basically no one decided to use the DNG except for a couple of companies. This allows you to convert your raw files to the DNG raw file platform. It's not something that I do, but if it's something that you wanted to do for some reason, you can easily convert when you import your images and switch those over to DNG. It does compress your image a teeny tiny bit and it saves you a little bit of space, but that's about it. So we have interface here. This is really just kind of to make it work or show things how you want them to be shown. Performance, this is how it works. Lightroom does use a graphic processor. So if you have a good graphics processor, especially if you're a gamer, go ahead, turn that on. That's gonna help Lightroom a little bit. Lightroom Sync is just for syncing with the mobile on a cloud. So that's what that stuff is doing there. It's allowing you to sync to the cloud. So display, I have two displays running, so this allows me to use two completely different displays to work on Lightroom. And then if I wanted to connect to a network, I could connect to a network here. And those are the basic preferences that we have inside of Lightroom. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna come up here and we're gonna take a look at just the, the basic window that you get when you open up the program. Up here we have the navigator and we have different ways to set this up. So I can click fit, I can click fill, one to one, one to 16. I'm just gonna hit fit. That's just how we are viewing this image. Here we have the catalog. One specific thing that Lightroom does is it actually catalogs your information. This makes it easy to find images and locate where they're at. What happens is when you import your files, you can allocate keywords and rename files and add folders. And Lightroom's gonna remember all of that information. One day, if you wanted to search for something that you see right here that's called Sunflower, you can just type that in and Lightroom's gonna be able to find it. Now the trick is you can never move your files. If you move your files or you swap hard drives, the location or path that they're located isn't gonna exist anymore. Lightroom's still gonna have a reference of it. You'll still see the image, but you'll get this little exclamation mark that's like, I don't know where the hell this photo's at. You need to show me where it is so we can use it again. All right, so here are some images I could show you. This is a basketball game. So you can see right here, there's an exclamation mark. Basically, it says photo is missing. It remembers the photo, but I moved these off my computer years ago, and so it cannot find them, and that's the little exclamation mark. And if you tried to open this up in the develop module to work on it, it won't let you do it because it doesn't know where they are. So the catalog has all your photos, your last import. It's kind of a quick way to navigate around different information. So folders is gonna show you the different folders and items that are located on your desktop or hooked up to your computer. The next thing we have here is collections. There's two different types of collections, a smart collection, which works on variables. You could say any image that I've ever imported and I have starred with one star, I want you to show in this collection. And you can do that by just about any variable you could ever think of. You could say anything I've shot with a 50 millimeter lens, anything with an ISO of 100, it will automatically put those files in that folder. The next one is a folder that you create yourself. So let's say I have a dog named Jack, and every time I take pictures of Jack, I can put my images in that one location or folder. 
That way, later on in the year, if I wanted to make something like a calendar, I don't have to navigate through 10 different folders to find the images of my dog, Jack. I can just go to that one location. It's not moving the files anywhere. It's just storing where they're located in one location. So that's what you would use collections for. And we'll go in more in depth into this. We have some publishing services in these just are kind of like little click setup buttons that you can automatically send photos to specific places. I don't use those. Right here, we have an import and an export. This is only available on the library module, but this allows you to import your photos and this will allow you to export your photos. So right here we have grid mode and this is what we see here which is grid mode and you can come over here to thumbnails and slide this to make your thumbnails larger or smaller depending on how you want them to be if you do not see this button right here hit the letter t the letter t hides the toolbar and shows the toolbar hides the toolbar and shows the toolbar this right here will take your thumbnail that you've selected and display at large so it's one image. And then once you're done with that, you can, I'm using my right hand on the arrow keys to toggle through my images. We'll go over that here in a second. The next one is for comparing and contrasting two images. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and click two images. So I've selected two images. And then if I come in here and say X and Y, it's showing me both of my images next to each other. So we'll go back to the grid mode. I'm gonna click on a third image and then I can come into this and this will show you multiple selected images together so you can see what they all look like together. And this last one, I don't have this set up, but this is for face recognition. If you have people that you photograph all the time and you want the computer to use its artificial intelligence to identify them by what they look like, you can do that. I don't use it, but that's what that is for. These are just arrows to toggle through. You could do this, I use the keyboard. We'll skip these for right now. We're gonna come back to them. Right up here we have different modules. So we have the library or the browser module. So the browser allows you to kind of go through your images and pick the ones that you like. The develop module, the develop module allows you to come in here and alter your image and change the way it looks. The map module allows you to Locate where you took the image if you want to do that. It's not something I'm going to waste my time doing. You can create a book, you can create a slideshow, and then we have a print module. And what I don't have up is actually the web module. Now, right now, these are your different modules. If you right click, so there's two ways to do this. You could, if you're on a PC and you have a mouse that can right click, or even a Mac that can right click, you can right click. And when you do that, these little tick mark comes up. Notice I don't have web ticked. So if I tick the web, it's gonna come up. If I right click and take map and it will go away. Now, if you don't have a mouse that right clicks on a Mac, you can hold down the control and just click. And that's a right click as well. You can do show all. So you can hide and show anything that you want. You can also do this in the develop module. So you can come out here, you can right click. So we can go customize develop panel. And what we can do is there's actually a whole bunch of different little things here that we can adjust. We can redo the order. We can turn some off or turn some on. We're not gonna do that right now. For right now, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave this as is and turn that back off. You can also come over here and right click on these little windows over here. And this will allow you to kind of change what you see as well. There's some little arrows. So if you notice, there's an arrow here, there's an arrow here, an arrow here. I'll come over here to this arrow. What this is gonna do is collapse this window. So if I come over here, it's gonna collapse this window. If I click on it, it's gonna hide that window. Now, any window that you collapse, you can get to by going and hovering over where it was. You can see it pops back up, and when I go away, it will hide that window. How you set this up is really up to you. I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it back on. Just like the other one, this is our thumbnails. I can come down here, click on this. It's gonna hide that window. I can hover over it, it will pop back up. I'm just gonna leave it up for these tutorials. So I can hide this one here, and I can hide this thing up here, which is my modules menu. You can also control the size of these windows. So what you wanna do is go right here where there's the two windows meet. We get a straight line with little left and right arrows. 
you click and hold, you can drag this this way or drag this this way. And that allows you to control the size of that window. And you can do it down here, over here, anywhere you would want to. You can always go. And if you get that little arrow, so I come over here, I get that little arrow. I can do it there. I can do it right here because I get the little arrow. The last thing that we have here is I've done this to a few images. So I've actually starred or tagged some images and I can isolate just the images that I have starred. And this is what we'll be getting into on the next tutorial. But if I go ahead and filter this, it's just gonna show me the images that I like. Well, this is video one on Lightroom Classic. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave those below. And as always, don't forget to subscribe.